Now, Andrew Lowney is the author of Stalin's Englishman. That's not me, that's Guy Burgess, uh, who, whose grave, it appears, uh, like uh, David Kelly's, can no longer be found in the ground of the church where it was laid. At least someone on Twitter was saying the other day that they spent the entire day looking for Guy Burgess. Maybe Andrew knows where he is, but more proximately, Andrew is the historian, the historian of the Mountbatten's, who featured in an ITV documentary this week, uh, which ran an old quote, but one which is startling in the context of royal families since, including in Buckingham Palace, since that uh, Lord Mountbatten said of he and his wife, uh, Lady Edwina Mountbatten, that we spent our marriage climbing in and out of other people's beds. You might say that this is a modern royal phenomenon, but then that means you haven't been watching the stories of the Tudors and uh, other uh, monarchs in England, and I dare say elsewhere. Uh, we're always lucky when Andrew is able to join us, and he joins us Again, now, Andrew, thank you very much. I'll come back to Guy Burgess because I'm going to go down to that uh, uh, churchyard and see if I can find uh, uh, Burgess's grave, as people were unable to do so over the last couple of days. But In sticking with the uh, Mountbatten's first, yes, uh, a group of people went down to try and find it, and they say it's not there. Uh, at least it's not findable. Maybe it's overgrown like much of his life uh, in weeds and, and, and so on. And maybe they just couldn't find it, but they couldn't find it. And I'm going to go down and make a little film uh, of me and Gayatri trying to find it. We'll come back to that, though. Uh, you saw, I presume, the latest Mountbatten documentary. What did you make of it? Uh, which one was this? I'm afraid I, I, I haven't. Uh, I was away in the states, so I've only just. Come ah, back. well, that case you didn't. Uh, you didn't see it. There was a kind of low rent documentary, nothing like as serious as your uh, your work on the issue, but it nonetheless re-established in the minds of its audience uh, the incredible levels of immorality, promiscuity, dishonesty, at very high reaches of the British royal family. It's not just Prince Andrew, he's not a bad apple. Uh, actually, it seems like three quarters of that barrel have been bad apples. Well, I mean, there's certainly, I think, two strands. There's the, the, the rogue royals, the Andrews, the, the, the Duke of Windsor and the Harrys. Um, uh, uh, who, in a sense, have used their position to, to line their own pockets and, and have ab abandoned their public duties. And then, you know, I think there's the, still the trope of, of public service, the Queen, uh, William and Kate and others. So uh, my own feeling is that the monarchy is secure. Uh, we have three generations, in a sense, in waiting. Uh, but clearly, as a writer, the rogue royals are more interesting. And clearly, as they begin to streamline the royal family, these rogue royals will be moved to, to the sidelines and presumably will be sitting up in Balmoral out of mischief. Well, you say that, uh, but you mentioned and prayed in aid of that point, uh, the Duke of Windsor. The Duke of Windsor's uh, error uh, was to seek to marry an American divorcee, but the next king of England is not only a divorcee, so is the uh, woman to whom he's married, and actually both of them were having an affair inside their marriages with each other. That's very Mountbatten-esque, isn't it? Well, Mountbatten, I think, was very open um, about it. The, the, the affairs really began with his wife because he was away. He was focused on his career, and as long as she didn't scare the horses, he was happy with these affairs. He then began to have his own affairs separately, not quite as many lovers as she had. Um, but I think as long as both of them were, were um, uh, happy uh, and it was all very discreet, I think the, the system seemed to work quite well. The children seemed perfectly um, accepting the situation. Uh, and these were often very long and affectionate uh, relationships. And in some ways, 
their marriage was stronger as a result of, of the fact that they had uh, outside lovers. But uh, the Mountbatten's, I think, are not unique in the royal family. I think there are plenty of members of the royal family who, who are busy having affairs on the side, and it's all just kept very quiet. Yes. Uh, well, it's very avant-garde of you to uh, look at it that way. I wouldn't have put you in for uh, avant-garde status myself. Uh, but uh, the, the continuation uh, of it, I mean, these people are supposed to be role models to the nation, aren't they? Uh, if they are climbing in and out of other people's beds, including in the case of Charles and Camilla, the, they were all friends. I mean, Charles and Diana and Camilla and her then husband, they were all part of the same circle. Aren't we supposed to be uh, looking for exemplars of family values in our, uh, our leading circles? Well, I think probably the public are a bit more accepting. I mean, uh, Andrew Parker Bowles, of course, had had an affair with Princess Anne before, and Andrew Parker Bowles... Um, uh, was known to be a man who enjoyed the company of women. So, um, uh, you know, it's very difficult for us an outsider to judge. But th I'm afraid these things go go on. I think they suspect they go on in ordinary people's lives more than one realises. Um, I think where they're of interest to someone like me as a historian it, with the Mountbatten's is when the, the private and public lives cross. Uh, and uh, we certainly had that with Edwina Mountbatten. Her relationship with Nehru did raise suspicions among... Uh, the, the, um, the various people of Pakistan, the feeling that he was uh, showing it some form of favoritism to, to Nehru uh, and that uh, Pakistan wasn't getting a fair shout. So for us historians, that's of interest. Of course, there's a prurient interest in, in other people's marriages and lives. Um, but I suspect it goes on much more than people realise. Uh, well, I hope not. Uh, but uh, you're you may a be right. Scott, uh, aren't you? You're also... Uh, no, I, I'm a Catholic rather than a Calvinist, but I, I find it extraordinary that we should be so accepting uh, of, of betrayal and, and dishonesty and deceit within what is supposed to be the core institution in the land, namely marriage and the family. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, as I say, slightly surprised that you're so insouciant about it, but well, you're absolutely done... correct. Uh, I've just done Edward VIII, and I think that one of the fascinating things were, there was to discover that this great myth of the man who married for love was, was, was just that, a myth, that he, um, Wallace, had had a, had a series of affairs throughout their marriage, beginning in 1937, uh, even when the surveillance was put on them by George V in 1935, it, just, it revealed that she was having an affair with a used car salesman called Guy Trundle, and he was having an affair with an Austrian princess. So I'm, you know, I'm afraid that it just, you just have to accept it. It goes on. And then, of course, she had an affair, a long affair with a, a young bisexual uh, 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 heir to the Woolworths fortune, Jimmy Donoghue. It was said that she'd given up her king for a queen. <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> Woolworths, all over the sweetie counter at, uh, at uh, Woolworths. So uh, this is your latest uh, work then, is it, on, on, uh, on uh, Simpson and, and Windsor? Yes, Trader King it, it is in fact just came out in paperback a few days ago to mark the 50th anniversary of the death of Edward VIII. Uh, and it looks at the period after the abdication. Most books in, end the story in 1936, but I think it's, well, the interesting bit is afterwards and his links with the Nazis, the fact that he was an active intriguer with the Nazis, not, not some sort of innocent dupe. Uh, and so it sort of, I think, gives us a new way of looking at the abdication, that he was, in my argument, manoeuvred off the throne because of his dangerous sympathies with the Nazis. Uh, Churchill actually threatened him with court-martial in 1940, and he was sent off the Bahamas to keep him out of harm's way. But even then, he was communicating with German agents, saying that he was prepared to come back as a puppet king. So this is the second of my uh, a trilogy on uh, royal marriages. The next one will be on, on the Duke and Duchess of, of York um, and looking at how a couple that is so happily divorced, what, what the nature of that relationship is. And of course, we'll be looking at... Uh, yeah, you might find it's money, who knows. Uh, in my own 
historical novel, a counterfactual novel, Queen's Way, uh, he does come back as a puppet king and Wallace becomes uh, the puppet queen and they're ensconced in, uh, in Buckingham Palace. I'll not tell you how it all ends. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, but uh, it is extraordinary, isn't it, uh, that the, our present queen's uncle uh, was a Nazi agent, uh, almost unabashed, unashamed. Yes, I mean, people were executed for far less than he did. He was communicating with the enemy in code uh, during wartime. Um, there were huge intelligence files on him and on his associates, many of whom were active German agents. Uh, and after the war, when German documents were discovered showing the extent of his treachery, there was a concerted effort by Eisenhower and Churchill to destroy these documents, or at least to, to suppress them. Uh, and these documents were um, basically suppressed from 1945 to 1957, and many destroyed. I think one of the fascinating things is the Royal Archives has now opened, and some of this material is available that people, I think, didn't expect it ever to be available. So we're getting a chance to, in a sense, tell the story of the Royals in a more accurate way. Up till now, it's been a very curated story, shaped by tame historians. Uh, and uh, I welcome the fact that the Royal Archives is opening and there's going to be more scope for us to, to tell the story of the past in an accurate way, because um, I think we're still far too deferential. We still have this Section 37 exemption of the Freedom of Information Act, which means that any reference to the Royal family uh, cannot be mentioned. Uh, and as I said to you when we spoke before, I've just mounted a six-year campaign to reveal the uh, letters and diaries, private letters and diaries of the Mountbatten's, which were bought with public funds to be open to the public uh, and which were closed. Uh, and now 99% of that material, 35,000 pages, have been released, which I think will be very useful for future historians. But the stuff that's held back, the redactions, are again very, very innocent. I mean, nothing in what was released is, is, is at all uh, sensitive. But even the stuff they've held back is, is just casual mentions of the royal family having tea or meeting someone. And I think until we have a slightly more grown up attitude to official secrecy uh, and also to protecting the royal family from anything that they maybe not want to, to have uh, revealed, you know, we aren't really a fully, fully formed democracy. Uh, I did say in my introduction that you uh, bravely, heroically fought those that would suppress uh, historical truth uh, for their own selfish interests or for the preservation of their own narratives. And congratulations on that great victory. 99% is a victory uh, in anybody's uh, uh, book. Uh, did you get your costs because... This all cost you an enormous amount of money. Yes, it's cost me £370,000. I've managed to crowdfund £65,000, um, but uh, I haven't, and I've failed in my costs application. Um, uh, they don't tend to award costs in tribunals, and I think it's just one of those things one, one has to accept um, that the system is, is not, shall we say, uh, very, uh, very good dealing with, with I was off a small, uh, basically operating with, with a lawyer, a uh, junior lawyer against a team of government solicitors and two top QCs. Uh, and I'm afraid the, the, the judges were often persuaded by, by in a sense, that firepower. Uh, I think one of the, the, the worrying things is that the information commissioner, which is meant to be the regulator and which decreed that this material should be released, didn't and, and, and to whom the appeal was launched. I didn't bring this, I'm defending it. The information commissioner, whose boss, of course, is the cabinet office, the people they were actually uh, against, uh, basically pulled their punches and, 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 and didn't really get involved. Um, but it is shocking that the two and a half mi million pounds were spent buying this, this collection for the nation. They, they trumpeted this as a huge and important collection just after Churchill's. Uh, and yet they then closed it and spent well over a million they refuse, of course, to give the costs uh, to make sure that we couldn't see it. Um, and uh, I just hope Pardon that me. perhaps Parliament and, and the media will begin to look at this. I think one of the shocking things for me was that the Cabinet Office were lying to parliamentarians, to my lawyers, and indeed to the media about this. Uh, we complain about Boris uh, Johnson complaining to the House, but um, there were countless statements made by government ministers which were uh, totally untrue. 
Government ministers making totally untrue statements, who would have thunk it? Uh, now, um, I've got to ask, none of all the remarkable material that your historical work has uh, revealed, none of it shakes your uh, confidence or your belief in a mo monarchical system uh, here in Britain? No, I think I, I'm, I would describe myself as a disillusioned monarchist. I, I would like the monarchy to behave better, and that's why I like to try and hold them to account. Uh, I think it's still the least worst system. Uh, uh, there are, as I say, members of the royal family who do a very good job. And I think if the royal family is streamlined, if there's more transparency about the costs of, of um, uh, running them uh, and the bad apples, because uh, I think it is bad apples, it's not everyone, uh, are basically sidelined. I think the, the monarchy will continue and it should continue. Lastly, then, uh, can you shed any light on, uh, on Burgess's grave? Because I, I, I'm planning my, my Great. trip. Great. Well, I, I will. It's, uh, I haven't seen it for a few years, but it's, uh, in fact, the grave of his father. It's got a little cross on it. It's just down an embankment about 50 yards from the church. Uh, I can't remember on which side. I think it's the south side. Um, and uh, it, it's very sad if it's overgrown because um, it was very carefully tended when, when I last was there a few years ago. Um, and uh, his nephews are okay, still Okay, I'll alive. give you a report. Uh, you've, uh, you've helped me. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll seek it out. And if I find it, uh, you'll see it on the show. And we'll make great. a little uh, video of it. And if it's needing uh, a bit of upkeep, uh, we will do that and let you know. Great. Andrew Thank Lowney, you. as always, good luck with the paperback uh, edition uh, of the book. I've yet to pick it up, but I will this week. The Traitor King. Who's the publisher? It's published by Bonnier Publishing, who published my book on the Mount Battens. I look forward to reading it very much and maybe Thank you. get you back on to uh, question you further on it. Andrew Lowney, That'd be lovely. Thank, Thank you, nice to talk to you for you. joining us.